All right, Perfect. thank you. Oh, All right. Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nathan, uh, for taking the time. I want to just jump in. So the Japanese author Rikuden recently won the Akutagawa Prize, one of Japan's most prestigious literary awards for her novel, The Tokyo Tower of Sympathy. In a recent revelation, she admitted that she used ChatGPT to help her write the book. That's just an early glimpse to what's to come. How will AI change writing? Yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think um, AI can play a powerful part in many different parts of the writing process. And I think also it's very poorly understood still. I mean, we're in the very earliest days of AI in general, but, you know, for, for writing specifically, of course, too. Um, and it's kind of like the analogy I have is it's sort of like 95 and the web browser first came out and we're the sort of like geeks that are excited about it and kind of like see the potential. And usually what happens in those situations is we're kind of right about a lot of stuff, but also like it's going to take longer probably for things to fully work its way through society and, and for stuff to get patterns to get discovered and figure out and arch architectures to get established it takes a lot longer than it might seem like it will. So, um, you know, will, will this happen faster than the early web? Probably. I think so. But at the same time, um, it will probably take longer than we think. So to answer the question of how AI will change writing, I can talk about how it's helped me, the kind of stuff we're building in Lex, the kind of thing I see, but I just wanted to start off with like, it's so early and the main thing is to it's still yet to be discovered. And, and, and most writers really don't use AI right now. I think it's like kind of a uh, more niche kind of new thing, and, and unless you count like, you know, grammar check and Grammarly and stuff like that, which is kind of AI, but um, not clearly not. It seems like where things are headed, right? So um, for me, I kind of break it down into the three different parts of the writing process, right? There's the first part. That's like figuring out what you're writing about in general, like the high level kind of organizing your thoughts. Maybe you have an angle or an idea that that is exciting to you and it kind of makes you want to start, but you got a bunch of notes, maybe you got a bunch of research and you need help kind of putting all the pieces together and organizing it, you know, perhaps into an outline or just kind of even figuring out like what's the heart of the thing. I think AI is incredibly useful at that. So like in Lex, the way that it works is... Uh, we encourage people to start their first version of a, of a document is just, it's like the brain dump, right? You could do a bunch of free writing. You could try and do an outline or two. You can paste in relevant material, quotes, research, et cetera. Um, and then you, you know, can just chat with the AI and it's got all that material in the document and it can kind of give you, give you some hints about like, Hey, I think this is maybe the most interesting thing. Or had you considered connecting these ideas? Um, and that part of it, it's just like, you know, having a second brain, obviously, in there, in, in the in the room with you when you're trying to figure this stuff out that's got, like, infinite patience and knows a lot of different things about the world. So that's kind of the first part is just figuring out the heart of the thing. The second part is uh, just getting through a first draft, right? So one of the biggest problems I run into when, when I'm writing is I get stuck. I, you know, write... And I'm, I, I don't know what to say next. And so AI is really great at just like, well, here's something you could say next, you know, and it's not always exactly what I want to say. I don't usually end up going with it, but it's just, it's a much better thing to do that when I used to get stuck, I just go to Twitter or something like that, <laughs> or like YouTube or beat my head against the wall. Um, and so it's really nice to, um, to have something that's more productive, I guess, to do when you're feeling stuck. Um, also just like looking up quick facts and things like that, or, or helping pull in something from, from a previous like resource or document, um, that you're, that you're kind of working with that sort of stuff is super helpful to keep you in flow. And then the part where I think AI really helps is, is the edit process. So at the third phase, right, this is where you've got a draft and you know, you, your goal now is to keep revising it until it's something that you actually want to ship. And it's kind of, it's, it's achieved at least close to perfection as us mortals can get it to. And so for that phase, the way that AI helps is there's kind of the early phases of the edit process where you're getting a really, a lot of high level feedback. It's like, how are my flow of ideas? You know, like what it does, does the beginning really hook people and it's more conceptual edits. And then, you know, as the process goes on and you get more solid, then there's like really polishing the sentences, trying to, you know, omit needless words as we've been told to do. And and all of the uh, all the good stuff that gets it to the point where it's really it's really finished. AI can even help with like fact checking and all that kind of stuff. So with Lex, for each of those different things, we've got we've got features and and processes kind of like built in to help writers. But like I said, it's early. I think we're still figuring out the best way to have AI help writers. But I don't think 
I guess maybe the last thing I'll say on it is I don't think that the future of, of how AI can affect writing is mostly about the AI doing all the writing for us. Because I think at the end of the day, people are interested in people. We're interested in what other people think, what experiences they've had. And um, I think AI generated writing obviously is super important, but it's going to feel more like accessing information systems, you know, like when you look something up on chat GPT and perplexity, um, you don't really think of it as writing. It's just sort of like you're, get, you're getting information, you know. Um, I think people will always be interested in other people's um, writing, you know, and, and, and reading stories and, and people's ideas. So um, for me, AI is um, there to help people write, right, rather than um, and remember and, and also to read and to organize ideas and all that kind of stuff. But it's not to replace people. Awesome. So you're building Lex, which is described as a modern word processor. And in that word processor, you are using a lot of AI tools to help writers. With just a simple YouTube video and demo, you gather around 25,000 users to sign up for it. And since then, you've raised money and you launched the app. What have you learned from your experience building the app from, from the demo to launching the app and gathering feedback from users? Yeah. Well, probably the biggest thing, and it's not necessarily like I had no inkling that this was going to be the case, but you know, the reality of it was much tougher than I than I could have anticipated, I think. It's just how huge of a gulf there is between um a writing app that's good for like quick minimalist stuff, you know, and it, it's got a little AI feature that makes a nice demo. I mean, I think it was great. It was amazing the response to the first version of the product. But you know, it was kind of like a prototype. It was a demo, right? To become actual writer's primary tool that like can can work, you know, in professional writers, amateur writers, and teams for people individually, you know, for, for like editorial content, for academic content, for marketing content. It just requires a lot of work. There's a lot of features that people expect. And it seems like such a simple thing, like, oh, Google Docs, it's kind of basic, right? Like, no, it's got a ton of stuff. And we're not even trying to do a lot of the stuff that Google Docs does around like print formatting and things like that. Cause our theory is, you know, th the first word process sources were kind of like page layout in a way. And then now what people actually want is they're shipping their text somewhere else over the internet, right? It's going to go into a CMS. It's not for the most part going to get printed. Um, so we're not even focused on all the print stuff, which is his own whole um, can of worms, but um yeah, it's just, there's a lot of little things that go into making it really good. And it's, it's not just the actual writing experience, but it's also like, you know, search and folders and there's just a ton of stuff to get right. So I think that's the biggest thing we've learned is it's like, you know, it's been a year and change since the original kind of like hello world demo version of Lex launched. And for, you know, from basically November, 2022 until like uh, August 2023, it was pretty much just me developing it. And I was working as hard as I can, fast as I can, trying to build <laughs> features. And then, you know, there was a process where we were hiring folks and, you know, I was more focused on building the team and, and finding the right people and getting them onboarded than I was on building features. And then, you know, finally now, uh, it's kind of like the team's been around for a little while. We're gelling. Everybody's kind of like learned the code base and it's just starting to rip. So I'm really, really excited about um, this year, because already, you know, it's we're a month in, and I feel like we've shipped as much this month as we did in the past three months, and I think it's just going to keep on going at this pace from here. And um, yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to like, you know, a year from now, looking back and being like, wow, we really transformed the product that year, and um, kind of got it to the place where we want it to be. Because a lot of these kind of tools, like if you look at the history of Notion or Figma or any kind of successful creative tool, they go through a long gestation period it's not like a social app where you have like a simple feature with a viral hook and a network effect and when they take off they take off overnight these kind of companies when they take off usually there is a period of years spent developing to get the product in a good enough shape because there's a lot of different stuff you need and also there's a level of polish that people expect you know uh and so uh you know we, we have not um We've not given up hope uh, that it's going to be uh, this like completely open to the right thing, but it's kind of like one of those where it seems like maybe an overnight success on the first week and you're kind of like, no, that's probably not going to be it. And indeed it was not it. And so since then, we've just been steadily chipping away at it and all the like retention, everything else is like kind of starting to pick back up. So it's, we're really excited about that. 
Yeah, your comments just remind me of another tool that I saw recently, Rabbit R1, which is this AI hardware. And the founder, Jesse, he has been at it for a decade. He had another startup that was building some sort of hardware that was not using apps. And that was a decade, decade long overnight su success. So that was yeah. cool to see. Um, cool. So let's dive in a little bit more into Lex. Um, what prompted you to create Lex? And what are some pain areas uh, that you know is resolving? And how does it make you write better posts or essays? Totally. Um, yeah, so it started uh, back my previous company, Every. You know, I, it's a newsletter that focuses on business and tech and like, you know, there's a lot of analysis and opinion, and that kind of stuff. And so I wrote a column there every week for years. And I also edited a lot of other people's work. And most of my background before that had been in tech and just writing was a hobby, but I kind of like went pro basically for a couple of years or as pro as you can call. I mean, it's not like I got hired by the New Yorker, but like whatever that was, it became my full-time job. And, um, it surprised me kind of, and it was really frustrating just in this low grade background kind of way, like just a lot of little paper cuts of like how annoying the workflows are around for, for shipping content, right? The creative tools are just not to the same level of quality as you get if you're a software engineer or a designer. Um, and so I thought, well, you know, whatever, we just, it's, it's good enough. Let's just keep going. And then um, a little while after my daughter was born, you know, I was on paternity leave and I was just thinking about like, what do I love to do? And like, how do I, when I, when I go back to work, like with some perspective now, having taken a little bit of a break, like what's, what's going to be something that is, uh, could be really impactful and, and just more importantly, fun. And I thought like, I want to take a crack at this Google docs thing. It's just so annoying. And I feel like, you know, this naive sense of like, how hard could it be? Right. Uh, to make a really good, to make a really good replacement for Google docs. And so, and, and part of it was just about stuff like Google docs does not work on the mobile web. Um, the way that the feedback and kind of track changes workflow works is frustrating a lot of time. Cause everybody's sort of fighting over the same space rather than like software engineers can create a branch of the code and then you got your own space to do your work and then it can kind of get merged back in. Everyone's sort of, you know, commits, so to speak for software engineers or everyone's edits are all kind of in one space kind of vying for what should go in. And it just gets overwhelming and messy. Um, it, things like that. But then also I was curious about like what AI could do. Cause you know, the big thing at the time was like image generators, like, um, you know, I think Dolly had Dolly two had just come out and like stable, stable diffusion was coming out. And so people were really like excited about AI generated images at the time, but you know, GPT three was out and it was good. And, you know, sort of there were, there were companies like uh, Jasper that were succeeding a lot. And I thought, well, they're doing something cool. If you want to use AI, like you want to go through a wizard and be like, let me fill in the blanks and it'll sort of generate a whole blog post for me. It's like, you could imagine if you're want to generate like hundreds of blog posts for like an SEO type thing, like that could be good. But for me, I couldn't really use it because I didn't really want the AI to generate for me. Like it wasn't good enough for that, but I did, um, you know, want it to help somehow in the writing process. And I just didn't know how. So that was sort of a thought too, going into Lex. And so really just spent like, kind of nights and weekends on it for about a month, getting the basic version one hacked together and got it to the point where we were using it internally. And we started showing it to some of the writers that, you know, are friends of ours that we worked with and we're getting some really good feedback from them. And so launched it. And, um, it just really, the main feature that the whole thing focused on was this idea of like, when you type plus, plus, plus the AI will fill in the next paragraph for you. It's just really, really simple. But it was, you know, enough, right? That people didn't realize like how good AI had gotten, I think. And this was like a couple of weeks before ChatGPT came out. So the timing was really good. It was, there's obviously something special in that moment of like uh, people, you know, now everyone I think knows how good AI has gotten, but at the time people really didn't um, for generating text. And so it was just the right time. It was just a really simple, easy to understand feature. Like conceptually people can understand. It's like Google Docs, but if you type plus, 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 the AI will generate a paragraph for you. And so I think just that simplicity and the concreteness of the value proposition got a whole bunch of people to sign up. Um, but of course, you know, a lot of it didn't stick around because it really wasn't good enough to replace Google Docs yet. And so uh, you would try it, you'd think that's kind of cool. Maybe you'd come back into it every once in a while when you wanted to use the AI, but it wasn't like, you know, uh, it wasn't ready. So that was obviously kind of uh, hard in some ways to go through, but I think super important. 
um, just, you know, for, for, to realize like, you know, Hey, this is a lot of the success of this is around just how good GPT three is that people didn't realize yet, but there's still, there's something here. Right. Um, and, uh, now the way that Lex helps you is a lot, a lot harder to copy a lot. It's, we, we've put a lot more work into it. It's not just sort of like a nights and weekends hack project. Um, and anyway, eventually just spun it out into its own company and decided that it's really what I want to focus all of my energy on and, and it should be its own thing. Um, so that was part of why it was just me working on it for so long. It's just needed to wait for that process to, to finish, which, you know, going through all the steps takes a little while. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the origin story of Lex. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. And can you dive in a little bit deeper right now on how Lex, the tool helps you or other write, writers write better posts and essays? How, how can it help writers? No. Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, there's a few, there's a few different things. Kind of like I was saying at the beginning, there's like the brainstorming phase, the like getting through your first draft phase, and then there's the, the editing phase, but maybe I'll go a little deeper on the editing phase. Cause like, I really think it's most valuable when you've got a draft of something and you're like, I want this to be better. I don't know exactly how it could be better, but I feel like it could. And this is normally like, you know, for me, I was super lucky to have like a group of really talented people to read my stuff and give me feedback, but it's hard to do that. And also, even though I had that group, like, you know, it takes them time. Right. And, um, really talented people are usually bottlenecks. They want, you know, there's a lot of people who, um, are trying to get their attention to get their feedback on, on stuff. Um, so, and it's just expensive, right. To like hire an editor. So Lex really can do a lot of the same type of thing. And there's a few different ways. One is like, there's basically a panel on the right side of the editor where it's like you've got your document on the left and then there's the chat on the right. And um, it's sort of like ChatGPT, except for it has access to read your document. So we've got some sort of preset things that are like prompts that we've created. And for some of these things, even like fine-tuned models that are designed to give you specific feedback that's more helpful than you would get just from ChatGPT. So there's sort of the convenience factor of not having to copy and paste a big thing and go back and forth. And then there's the like, you know, the other difference of just sort of like chat GBT doesn't have our, our prompts or our fine tunes. So for instance, one of the things, if you click the like sort of get feedback on my draft button that you can get is like, it really helps guide you towards a more unique idea, right? Because this is one of the biggest things I see is like either A, the thing is not super clear or coherent or B, maybe it's clear, but I just, you know, I've heard it before, right? So it's not, it's not going to be super interesting. So in the case of blog posts, it's really valuable. And it turns out AI is quite good at knowing what it's seen before and when it hasn't seen something before, right? It's like, it's seen a lot more than any human has. Um, and it kind of, it has a sense of like, yeah, I've heard this story before, right? Which readers also obviously have that sense. And when they've heard the story before, they're not like that interested in it. Like you could imagine if someone published a piece, why AI is going to change the world. Like, are you going to click that? Absolutely not. Like you, you, you get it already. <laughs> it's fine, right? Um, you know, but if it's like, how AI is going to, um, you know, allow writers to have this new layer between them and an editor and readers that makes the writing better. It's like, well, that's kind of specific. It's a little better. Like it's, it's definitely more specific than just how it helps writers or whatever. So anyway, AI is great at that. Um, another example of like more on the level of sentences really, and less of just the high level conceptual part, but more like, let's just fine tune the prose here is we have this feature called checks. And the idea is, you know, there's the basics that we've had forever, like spell check and grammar check, but we've, we've built these higher level things based on fine tuned models where it's like gravity check. Can you go through my piece and help me, you know, say less, omit needless words, right? That just shaving off those little moments of kind of like you can help get people to their ideas faster really helps. And AI is quite good at helping kind of streamline prose. Um, and at first we had a lot of trouble building it because it was like, it feels like it felt like it was really removing the tone of like, or like the personality of the writer, but we've started to make a lot of headway against that when we've done our own fine tunes. So that's one example of a check. Another is like readability check, like looking at convoluted sentence structures and kind of simplifying them. Another one is cliche check. If there's like overused phrases and words, like, you know, let me pick your brain is kind of classic. Um, so that's, that's another valuable check. But yeah, those are really great to run um, towards the end of your process. And it helps find things that like, again, good editors would pick up on, but this is available when you want it, no matter what time it is within like instant or basically instantly. 
rather than kind of having to wait a day or two to get to hear back from somebody. That, that's super interesting. Yeah, it seems that you're applying all the rules and what you've learned at every with editors and, and helping writers be better at their job. So that's really, really cool. To yeah, see. that's it. I mean, that's exactly right. It's basically like, I think the thing that makes Lex different from a lot of other AI writing tools is like, I spent a while, a big chunk of my career writing as a hobbyist. But then after that, like professionally, full time writing and editing, and you just learned a lot of stuff along the way. And I think this is the case for a lot of fields, like a, an expert can kind of pick up on these heuristics and teach them to AI, you know, and um, I think I think it's a general purpose formula kind of for AI companies these days is someone who knows a lot about a thing can kind of like through some combo of prompts or retrieval augmented generation or fine tuning or whatever, help the help guide these sort of generally super capable models to specifically being really good at the thing that they do best, which for me is definitely writing, editing, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's super interesting. So let's jump a little bit back uh, to your career. You've been as you mentioned, you've been in media for some time and you've been involved with Silicon Valley companies for some time. And uh, I want to go all the way back to Product Hunt. So yeah. Product Hunt is one of the most important products in Silicon Valley. It has a big influence uh, for tech companies and it has become the launchpad for new products and getting early traction. Can you tell us a little bit of your story of how involved you were in the early days of Product Hunt? Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, Ryan Hoover, the founder and CEO of Product Hunt, or a former CEO of Product Hunt, um, and I were friends just in San Francisco. We had worked on some side projects before. And so his original kind of version of Product Hunt was really basically an email list. It was using this product called Linky Dink, where like a group of people could sort of add links to a page and then it would get a summary of all the links we get emailed out to the group. So it was, it was using a cool kind of like twist. Um, but, um, anyway, this, this linking Dink product was kind of like the MVP and he, you know, we were, it was going for a while and we thought maybe this could be, or he thought maybe this could be like a real thing. So he emailed me and he was like, hey, I'm thinking about turning it into like a real website, like build a custom thing for it. And, um, I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. And I would love to do it if you're looking for someone. Um, Cause you know, my background is kind of like generalist programmer designer. Um, so he said, yeah. And we started working on it. We, you know, the first version was uh, written in Ruby on rails and I just did it like over Thanksgiving weekend. Basically um, I was at my parents' house in Arkansas and um, you know, it was pretty, it was pretty simple, right? It was just, you could post a pro or like if you had, access there was kind of like uh you know you had to get an invite to get in but you got you could post a product and people could vote on products and comment and just the really simple format of like they're grouped by day and they're within the day they're sort of like the leaderboard based on who has the most um votes and so i was kind of like the main designer and engineer i guess on it uh for the first like couple months and then when ryan decided to go full time on it i was like already i was like in the middle of moving to new york for like this job that I loved. I'd already been there for a year, but I was like moving to New York to kind of like go to headquarters or whatever. And the thing I was working on there was also kind of like my baby. And I was just sort of like, ah, this is hard to decide. So I ended up, you know, not joining on with Product Hunt full time, like as a co-founder or anything, but I guess I'm like sort of co-creator in a way um, or like first engineer kind of on it. And um, yeah, it was just a ton of fun. And it was really informative to like be able to watch Ryan build the early community, which is like the real secret sauce, I think of product hunt and like the, the product design and all that stuff helped, but it was just amazing to see, um, how, when you kind of combine a good piece of software with someone who can go out and build the community around it, uh, that it, that it can really be quite magic. So it was so fun to see product hunt sort of like blow up and become this. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's like this institution basically. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny cause last fall was the 10th anniversary of product hunt, which is funny. It made me feel very old, but I, yeah, I went to like the anniversary party in San Francisco or whatever that they put on. It was just so cool to, um, to see, yeah, all the people from back then and people from now that, um, you know, product hunt has helped them get awareness for their product and help them discover cool new things. So, um, yeah, very proud that I could play a part in the early days of it. That's, that's super cool. So you wrote the first version of Product Hunt. That's, that's super interesting. Also, I mean, you mentioned you had 
a bunch of experience in different companies. You've held positions in different media companies, including being VP of product at Substack, worked at uh, Gimlet Media, and started every. You've been working in media in one form or another for some time. What are the most important lesson, lessons that you've learned over time, including at companies like Substack? Oh, great question. Um, well, I'll start at Substack. You mentioned that one. So a lot of other people have started newsletter platforms, right? Or even like paid newsletter platforms. And the thing that made Substack different was one of the co-founders, you know, was a journalist, was a writer. He, you know, he had a book deal, all that kind of stuff. So he knows, he knows how writers think. He knows how to talk to them. He knows what they're worried about. He knows what they're excited about. And, you know, Hamish full time would basically talk to writers. He would go get on calls with them. He would go to lunch. He would go to dinner. He would organize, you know, events and happy hours and coffees and stuff. And, um, you know, in the early days, it was just sort of like talking to folks, but then Later on, the thing that really made Substack start to grow pretty quickly and attract the biggest name people is Substack started offering these deals that were kind of similar to like a book deal, right? And so I think there's this category of business that a lot of people in tech don't really understand that it's like, it's not enterprise software and it's not consumer software. It's like, it's talent business. And so there's aspects of it that are kind of similar to enterprise, but you're not really selling to enterprises, like the whatever, the buying process, the, the whole thing is like different. It's a talent business. And so Substack was just the best at the talent side. Um, and they've got always had this really solid product vision, right? Of like a cool, simple platform where it's just enough of like, you can control it and configure it, but not so much that it's a pain in the ass to set up, you know? Um, and so I think that's the real secret sauce. And there's a lot of other businesses that are sort of like, you know, creator businesses or businesses trying to find talent that I think... Um, still really haven't quite figured out the lesson that Substack did just naturally because of having Hamish as a co-founder who, who is a writer and understands, you know, what, what writers need. Um, I think that was the biggest lesson. Maybe the other lesson is um, product market fit is something that sort of happens gradually and then all at once. So usually what happens is you kind of start off and there's like an inkling from some people that it works, but there's a lot of, you're not like instantly growing overnight. And you just kind of keep pulling on that thread and chipping away at it. And enough of the pieces come together that like at some point it's like, oh man, and it starts to tip. But I think a lot of companies give up too soon on uh, trying to go for product market fit because they feel like, well, you know, if we haven't succeeded overnight, then it's never going to succeed. And I really don't think that's true. And I think the reason why is this thing that a lot of people really do recognize and believe they just maybe don't follow all the consequences in their head all the way through, which is like execution is everything, right? Like people in Silicon Valley absolutely believe that execution is everything and like whatever ideas are worth nothing. That's like a common trope. And it's absolutely true in a way. I mean, ideas are whatever multipliers for execution. But I think that if you kind of um, play that out, what you'd realize is unless there's like there are some corner cases where things can just really blow up really quickly, but usually what happens is um, it takes a while to refine the thing well enough that it actually is a well-functioning enough system that it can start organically growing on its own. There's just a lot usually that you need to sort of set up and do, and it takes some time to do that. And it's okay if it's not like consistent week over week, week over week growth. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't worry about it or shouldn't think about it. Like, yeah, you should always go for it, but stick with it. You know, as long as there's some people who really love what you do and they keep sticking around, you can probably find more if you just hone in on what do they like about it and how do we make it more obvious and how do we make it even better and how do we polish out the rough edges and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the other thing. Cause the early days of Substack, like, you know, it was working, but it wasn't obvious that it was like, I mean, like we were having conversations. I was the first employee there and I, I was there when we were having conversations about like, do we have product market fit? Well, if you have to ask that question, probably not like, you know, and there was never a moment that fundamentally changed it. The biggest change was when they started offering these sort of book book style deals, basically, of like an advance to people. But um, you know, that was just sort of one piece in the in the puzzle. And there's still like there, there was, it's not necessarily that there had to be some big pivot or something like that. Um, so that was another important lesson. Interesting. And can you dive a little bit more into when did this sort of deals start happening. I imagine they had raised some money, right? And they had some traction yeah. before 
it happened? Was it when they had enough money or, and were there, they pulling, you know, talent that had the potential of a lot of subscribers? How, how did that work? Yeah, there's kind of two different phases of it. There was a few deals we did just off of the seed round, which they raised right out of Y Combinator. And then they did more and bigger deals after they raised the Series A from Andreessen and Horowitz and then even more and bigger when they raised the Series B. Um, so that was kind of the, uh, the the timing of it all. And the time when it really started to feel like, oh, wow, Substack's really taking off. It's like all these writers that I've I've heard of and like famous people are like signing up for Substack happened after the series a for the most part awesome yeah that the the thing about sticking to it i don't know if it was like it seemed to me that that kind of strategy wasn't is is not as publicized in silicon valley the the strategy that's publicized is like oh you need to get to something that's growing the first day um and not it's, it's not like oh you should stick to it you know like Substack did. And it seems to me that a lot of the success stories are of people sticking to an idea. Like even Coinbase, which my friend was a really early part of it, they saw growth and the growth stalled for some time. And yep. people inside the company, they were wondering, you know, what's going on? And Coinbase is one of the most, like the fastest, one of the fastest growing stories inside Silicon Valley. If you think about it from inception to IPO, which is very, very interesting, but that's super cool to, to totally, to, yeah, totally. I, th I mean, in Coinbase, like a lot of people don't know this, but Brian Armstrong, before he started Coinbase started this, like, it was like an Android Bitcoin wallet. And like, you know, it did all right. Like there were some people that used it, but like, you know, the conceptual leap to like, I should really go all in on this and go to YC and all this stuff. Like how different would it really be? Maybe if just turning it into like a web thing rather than like android like and this was back in the day when i'm you just downloaded the whole blockchain to like build the device locally because <laughs> uh, and that's how it worked um you know and so the the conceptual leap of like oh this will be like a really trusted thing like a financial institution kind of a vibe you know like and that's that's what'll win and we want to get the, like legitimate legitimacy from like top investors and all that kind of stuff it's like it is a little bit more to the kind of Keith Raboy philosophy of it's like casting a movie, right? You have to raise the necessary funds and go and make the big thing happen and don't shy away from it. And maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but like you can sort of like make a relatively bigger bet. And it's not just all about instant success or we pivot like on a weekly basis, you know? Um, yeah, I'm definitely, I subscribe more to that approach. It can go wrong though, because there are certainly just wrong visions, right? And it's hard to know if yours is right or not right. But I do think, you know, it's kind of like there are some people who are just really good at a certain thing that's very hard and you get to that point by trying a lot. But, you know, it, I mean, I tie it back to writing, right? Like there are some writers who just, you know, their next book is at least going to be like r fairly good, if not really, really good. Or like directors, you know, like screenwriters, they just have they know what to do, right? And it's a hard thing to really do that, right? And maybe they won't be able to do that forever. But um, I think that it's worth sort of trying to get to the point in your career where you start to feel that way about your ideas and you can, you feel more conviction to like stick a little longer and you sort of built confidence because you've seen like, yeah, I thought this was cool. And then I put a lot into it and then it was cool, right? So I, once you've been through that loop a few times, it, it gives you, it's easier to have the conviction, I think. Um, but it's hard yeah. to bootstrap that conviction. It's very hard to, unless you just stick with it, you know, kind of blindly in a way. Yeah, I, I agree with you that it's it's similar to Hollywood in some ways. And if you like, when I think about the best entrepreneurs, they they started early and they work really hard, you know, in their entrepreneurial journey. So like when I think about Stripe, the Stripe founders, they started another company before Stripe. They started very early. Uh, the Brex founders, they had a company in Brazil. And like, if you go down the list of a lot of the top entrepreneurs, like if you think about Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, they, they started very early. Yeah. So it's, and, and they kept working at it, you know? So it's, it's very interesting to see. And you mentioned the Substack strategy. It seems, and Keith Rabois, it seems that he's following a similar trend with open source. 
where he's yeah. buying, you know, the suppliers uh, in e-commerce and trying to build this marketplace. Um, so that's interesting. So let's move on to a little bit more into the media part. So, I mean, you've worked in, in different parts of the industry from Gimlet Media to Substack and even Avery, where you, you were a co-founder there. And the media landscape has been changing quite a bit. What are some of the most interesting trends that you've seen and companies that work in media that you've seen emerge in the, you know, the past few years? Yeah, I mean, it's a really, really bleak time right now. So uh, I think what's happening, and it depends on different types of media that you're talking about, but like, you know, let's, let's talk about like, uh, like news ish type stuff, news analysis, commentary, et cetera. I think, um, you know, most attention is flowing through YouTube these days. It's like YouTube, TikTok, like it's video, right? Instagram. Um, and people still read newsletters, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who read newsletters every day, obviously. Um, but it's harder video and, and, you know, podcast flavored video and all that kind of stuff. Like it's, it's, um, it's just easier to capture attention and by and large, the business model of a traditional publisher just, it, it seems like it doesn't really work anymore because they used to be the best way to reach customers. If you're a marketer and you wanted to buy ads and then now they're like not on the list anymore. And, you know, uh, people just marketers put their ad dollars directly through basically Facebook and Google, you know? So it's like Instagram ads, YouTube ads, that kind of stuff. And, um, and so it's really, really hard. And there's been tons and tons of layoffs in the news lately. And, um, you know, even like Gimlet, they got acquired by Spotify. It was a great outcome, you know, financially back when it happened. But then now, like, it doesn't, it basically doesn't exist anymore. There were big layoffs and it's kind of a shell of its former self. And it's sad, you know, that it's like, it's hard to build an organization. It seems like create individual creators can kind of do kind of well, but it's really hard. There's not like a bunch of organizations that are like working as media and like, you know, every works because it's, um, you know, not 100%, but basically bootstrapped. And there's, I think there's a lot of other similar stories where it's like, you're either an individual creator or you're kind of a small group of creators. And, you know, it's, it's not like, um, it's not trying to build the sort of like media company of yesterday. It's like a new model that's more creator centric, you know, but the tough thing about that is especially for news, like, um, I, t in order to sort of do original good research and uh, you need a certain amount of freedom, you need to hime, you, you know, you don't like the pressure to sort of generate attention, grabbing articles to like just survive is it leads to bad journalism, you know? And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing is kind of like institutions that are going a little bit wrong. A lot of people are not super happy with the quality of a lot of journalism. At the same time, there's still a lot of really incredible journalism but it just doesn't happen that often. And, you know, cause there's not always like some huge story. And then meanwhile, you know, local places uh, are barely even being reported on, right? Um, like local newspapers are totally in shambles. And so it's a huge problem. And um, I am optimistic at some point that there will be a new model that works for this because um, I just think it's too important, not for society to somehow figure it out. But right now it's unclear what that is. And I think the big worry is, if there's some future model that's like this new internet native kind of truly internet native thing that happens, like at what point does it get functioning so that like society gets the news that it needs in, in a format that it needs um, uh, before the old stuff just goes bust? Cause it's so, you know, it's, it's so precarious. So um, yeah, when you ask about what's exciting and new, unfortunately I, it's like, there's not a ton with that. I mean, you know, obviously it's great to be an individual creator, but like, you know, it's hard for individual creators to break news, to do research, to because what creators are good at is like opinion, analysis, discussions, like personality, what all that kind of stuff, which is not the same thing as just like doing research for months, trying to like cultivate sources and look through a whole bunch of documents and whatever. Like it just doesn't lend itself to creating posting, you know, every day or every week or whatever. So I don't know, but I mean, I'm, I am optimistic that something will happen with it. Um, and I think probably it'll be through some combo of creators and journalists because there are distinct skills, you know, but if you can kind of 
pair them together, you may have something that works. Interesting. It seems that we're in a in between stage, and hopefully we will get to like through this bump. Um, so let's go into a little bit more into every. So every started as a business inside a platform and decided to move to host everything to be inside its own platform. What are what were some of the benefits and downsides of that move? Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, we started out inside Substack just because it was like really fast, you know, and also I had my newsletter, my co-founder Dan had his newsletter. We didn't even bundle them together at first. It was just like, we didn't even seem like a company. We just seemed like two guys who, you know, had Substacks basically. Um, and, um, you know, the vision of it was to be a bundle where a bunch of different writers could kind of all write under the same brand and pool the audience together. Um, and still have their own individual identity and creative freedom, but just to really benefit from from the sort of pooled audience if it was all kind of on a similar similar wavelength to a similar type of person. Um, and to have a shared subscription because I, our feeling was that there's a limit to the number of individual newsletters you might want to subscribe to, but if there was a bundle that had a whole bunch of people that you liked, that that, that could be a better better value for money. Um, especially for writers who don't necessarily, I mean, it's hard to get to the point where you want to like launch a paid newsletter and then write for it all the time. So for people who maybe want to write one thing a month, you know, it felt like there was a big opportunity to kind of capture, be a good place for that. Right. And to, and to be able to capture more money from that than you could, if you're, if you're just writing one thing a month, but trying to do it as a paid thing or just doing it for free. Cause you know, it's hard to sustain a subscription unless you're really publishing like every week, maybe even every day. Um, and so that basically was just hard to set up inside Substack. Technically, it's designed around a single, you know, individual voice, right? Um, and so a lot of little aspects of the experience from the design to some of the like just functional things of like, do we have the data we need to like split revenue appropriately, like based on some, you know, contracts we can negotiate with writers and all that kind of stuff. It just seemed tough. So um, we built our own platform and very happy we did it. It gave us total control over pretty much every aspect of it. And, uh, you know, also just the branding and design of the page and stuff. I feel like it matters to kind of have a little bit of a unique feel, um, to have our logo in the corner in like our own way, right. Rather than, rather than sort of plugging into the, to the default template. But then on the other hand, you know, we gave up a lot by, it took time, it took focus, it, it took money. Um, we also gave up on Substack's distribution, right? So like they didn't have this when we were there, but Eventually, they launched this sort of network, and you know we had a lot of friends who were solo writers that stayed on Substack and massively grew because of Substack's network, like Lenny um, and like Packy. So, of course, not the only reason why behind their success, but it helped, right? It helped a lot, and it would have been a nice boost for us too that we didn't that we didn't really have. Um, and so, you know, there's there's pros and cons. Um, and you know, if we had to go back and do it all over again, like would we have been on our own platform, like? Maybe, probably, but it was certainly um, a bigger sacrifice than um, than we thought at the time. Uh, and so, but I, th I think in general, that's sort of like the tough thing about in media, usually the strategy that works is to like, like conform to whatever the platforms want. And we thought <laughs> maybe if in writing, like the platform wasn't that powerful. So like we could kind of do our own thing a little bit more. And that's part of what we liked about the idea of getting into writing rather than like YouTube or podcasts or whatever. But I think kind of basically the same lesson applies. Like video creators have to really conform to what YouTube wants or TikTok or, or Instagram. And, and I think writers probably succeed by conforming to what Substack wants. And if you don't like that, then you can do your own thing and it can work, but it's just, you're, you're losing something um, audience wise by doing that. Um, but it's interesting. I don't know over the long run like how that'll play out because it's still Substack is not the same. It doesn't have the same role for writing as YouTube does for video, you know, um, or TikTok or, or Instagram. It's not as central. Writing is not near as centralized. So and you know, competitors like Beehive and ConvertKit and um, Ghost and all that kind of stuff. They still they have they have decent market share. So it'll be interesting to see. What do you mean uh, they don't have the same rules? Uh... Oh, As the you... same role, the same role. So like oh, if you're okay. like, nobody has their own site where they post their videos. Whereas with writing, a lot of people have their own, it's like their own domain name. You have no idea what platform they're using. It's just the, the platform is really email actually is what it is. It's not Substack, it's email, right? That's the network. And so, um, yeah. Whereas with YouTube, it's like, 
it's totally centralized on like, you, you, or sorry, with video generally, like long form, it's basically totally centralized on YouTube and then short form, it's like reels and TikTok. Um, and there's not a lot of other options, you know? Awesome. Cool. So let's switch a little bit into every and how your more, your experience there. Um, so I saw one of your posts that did the best was a post talking about the performance of, of, of writing inside every. So you basically mentioned that what you've learned at every is that if a post doesn't perform well, it just means that it wasn't good enough. What are the characteristics of, uh, of your, of the best post and what does it mean to be, uh, a good enough post? Yeah, totally. So, um, having, having beat my head against the wall for like years trying to make essays that spread and that work, it's definitely, uh, something that I put a lot of energy and thought into and it's always a tricky balance, right? Because on the one hand, um, you just want to make something that you think is awesome right? And you don't really want to worry too much about what people think. On the other hand, part of making something awesome and good is like having it resonate with other people. And so it's, um, I think ultimately most really good things like do find an audience and resonate. And you can tell from the way that people talk to you and the way that people respond and the way that people share it, that it made an impact on them. And, um, anyway, I came up with this, there's this book, uh, called made to stick that has like, it's about like, stories or ideas like how you get people to remember them or whatever and i have a kind of alternate version of that where it's like how do you make an, an essay that like spreads or i have this acronym stirk and it's sort of it's intentionally kind of stupid basically but like so surprising true important relevant and cool these are like my if i have to go down the checklist when i'm like reading something you know and i'm thinking about is this going to spread this is the this is the checklist that i go down so surprising is like does it say something you expect, like AI is going to change the world or something surprising, like AI is going to stall out? Maybe it's like, oh shit, you know, maybe, maybe, or maybe neither of those are particularly exciting because it's such an active debate. It's like you just get lumped into one or the side or the other as some tribal dispute, right? Like <laughs> technology is good or bad or what, you know, or media is good or bad. Um, so surprising is something you didn't expect, right? And I, this literally operates at a neurological level. It seems like from the, what I understand of the, of the neuroscience, our brains are not just like a camera showing us reality, our brains are computing reality and it's a function of our expectations. And so something's like too far off of our expectations. It does literally doesn't even compute. Like we just don't notice it because the reality we perceive is constructed according to like our expectations. But so what you want is that sweet spot where it's like, there's just enough familiarity for you to make sense of it and to notice it. But enough of a twist, oh, I've got my little, <laughs> I've got my little like uh, thumbs up thing, um, but just enough of a twist um, for, for you to be like, hold on. And you want to know more, right? The T, so that's surprising. True is, you know, I could tell you something surprising, but if it's not true, then, then you don't really care. It just seems dumb, right? Like the sky's red or whatever. Like it, it's not, it doesn't even compute as surprising because it's just, it's obviously not true. Um, but if I said, you know, uh, the United States is um, dividing into four territories and like it was the New York Times saying it, you actually feel like, whoa, like that would be hugely surprising. And like, you, there's a world in which maybe that happens in the future or something crazy. And if the New York Times is telling you, then like, oh my God, like that feels like it might be true. Um, and then uh, the next one is um, important. So like just how much import does it have for the world overall? Like the United States dividing into four, that's like a world historical event. That's super, super important. Um, whereas, you know, maybe there's something that's like, it's, it's against your expectations and it's true, but it just doesn't, it's not, it's not that important. Like, you know, this ant just leaped up two meters or whatever, like, okay, I don't care that much. Um, and then relevant is like its impact specifically on you. So, you know, maybe if India broke into four, it's a little less, it's still important, but to you it, relatively, it's a little bit less relevant than maybe America, which is where we live, um, breaking into four. Um, and then the last, so that's uh, surprising, true, important, relevant. And then the C, the Sterk, the C at the end is uh, cool. So it's like, what does it say about you if you share something about this? Does it make you look cool? So you could have something that fits all of the above, but it's like, you know, maybe it's like some really cool, interesting blog post about like how to get 
become a guest on podcasts. It's like not cool. It's a little thirsty to be like, oh, here's the best way to like get invited to be a guest on podcasts. Like you want to be so cool that people just invite you, right? So it's like, maybe it's not the coolest to like share that, even if it really attracts your attention and it's like super valuable to you. You just might not tell people about it or share it because it doesn't make you look like awesome. Whereas like, you know, if there's some like VC thesis essay, that's like a new way of understanding how technology is going to evolve. And it's like a surprising but true theory and it's like important it's relevant to like the work that you're doing you also look cool by sharing it and sharing your own little comment on it because it's like yeah i'm a person who knows a lot about the future of of tech or whatever so that's more likely to go viral than something that makes you look not as cool um so those are like the key things i look for it's it's my own little framework i you know it's kind of intentionally a little bit dumb but it, it helps me remember it and um it's an easy checklist to roll through when you're reading something and by the way it's the kind of thing that an AI uh, editor reading an essay can also look out for. Um, so, yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking behind in my head. I'm like, oh, this can be something that, you know, a chatbot can help writers. Uh, that's really, really interesting. Um, maybe surprising and uh, <laughs> maybe yeah. it check, checks all the, all, the, all the points that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, one last question, and that's about the every as a business. Every has grown over time from when you started to, you know, having more writers and things like that. What lessons have you learned over time starting that, that media company as in the business side of things? Oh, well, I think this is kind of general to all media companies, but the number one constraint is just talent. It's so hard to find people who are willing and able to produce the kind of content that people want to consume. It's really hard. It's first of all, it's just really hard to make great content. No matter what kind it is, writing, video, podcasting, whatever, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of time. And when you catch people when they're just getting started, they're not good enough yet. And so as much as you might want to root for them and help them it can't help the business. It can't sustain itself because there's not an audience for it yet, probably. Um, and then on the other hand, especially in something like analysis and opinion and commentary about tech, like there's very few people who are doing, who have the sort of like uh, insight about the world that people want to hear that also want to like professionally full-time write about it. And so what you end up with is we're really competing with like tweets basically. Cause like anyone can compose a tweet and maybe it's interesting, or maybe even a couple tweets that they string together in a thread. Um, but to really publish like an essay length thing, which we all, I mean, I think a lot of us have had the experience of like, you really like a deep essay and you don't want it all the time, but it's, 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 it would be sad if all I had was tweets. Right. Um, <laughs> but like, it's hard. It's much harder. The level of difficulty to put together an essay that goes deep on something and holds attention versus just a tweet is really tough. So it's just very hard to find talent for every, and I think for every, creative business, not just, not just every, all creative businesses, um, they, uh, they, they struggle with this or there's talented people, but if you're talented, you have options, you can go direct, right? You can just do your own thing, right? Um, it used to be the case that the media companies were the ones that controlled the printing press and the distribution to audiences. And there was just no, like, what are you going to do? Make your own newspaper? Like, it doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, but now, yeah, the, I mean, we're just a, newsletter or a YouTube channel or a podcast channel or whatever, like anybody else. Right. And so you can just start your own. Everybody's got the printing press now. And so it's all kind of like on even terms. Um, and, and that, that's where we thought, you know, the bundle made sense. I still think it does make a lot of sense, but it's just, okay, well, who are you going to put in it? Right. And who, who wants to be a part of it that like wants access to this extra exposure. We've been able to figure out a market of basically people who are experts helping them on the writing side. And then, you know, they want to write something every once in a while. But if you've got, if you have like 50 people that want to write one thing a year, you've got like almost a year's worth of programming. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, for, for, for each week of the year or whatever. Uh, so um, yeah, it's, it's relatively easier for us to have kind of have like a wide pool of writers um, who aren't professional writers, but that we can pair with people who can help get their essays to the point where um, they're, they're good. So that's, that's kind of where it evolved. Um, and uh I think, you know, probably the other aspect of that is that I have a lesson learned is like just a revenue cut is like not near enough. So if you like go to someone and you're like, hey, we'll offer you like 90%, 95%, 99%, you know, 
but that's basically just giving them some software and that, and you're not really doing anything else for them. Like the default is like, nothing's going to happen. It's not like revolutionary to offer people that like the default is anyone can publish for free online and charge. And like the, 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 at that point you're just competing with like Stripe fees, basically. <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? Um, and so uh, I think that you, there's this barbell of either like, you're just software, like you're Stripe basically, or you are providing support and distribution and a brand, some prestige, right? Some coaching, all that kind of stuff. And that's what makes it worth it is like to be on the really the far other end of that barbell where it's like, um, there's a lot that you're getting besides the, and the revenue is not even necessarily the main point at that, at that point. Like maybe you just get like an honorarium basically. And that's enough. If you're like a VC who it's not, what are you going to do with like a thousand dollar check? You know what I mean? Uh, like the honorarium is maybe like, it's just cool to do a part of this to, to help straighten out your thoughts, to learn about writing, to get in front of this audience. Like those are the main reasons why you would do it at that point. So we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Nathan, for taking the, the time. Uh, do you want to drop in? We can find Lex, you on social media, and where can people find more about your work and things like that? Yeah, totally. So uh, Lex.page is where you can find Lex. It's free to sign up. We've got a really generous free tier. Um, and really, we only charge for kind of like the expensive AI models like GPT-4 and stuff like that. But all the features work, and you can you can try them with the, with the free models. Um, and then me, I'm on Twitter. Uh, N B A S H A W and Bashaw um, is my handle. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. Thanks it was great, great to chat with you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much.